Okay, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk to you about um, a little bit more about the FTIR, but in a slightly different format. Okay, so do a technical overview of basically what FTIR is about. Um, FTIR that we utilise is a um, system, a Brooker system. Uh, we use it with the ATR sampling system, uh, which is a fixed path. Uh, analysis typically takes about two minutes. Um, there are no, as I say, special uh, radiation licenses required. The instruments are low cost and very robust and with internal quality uh, performance checks. Uh, they are small and lightweight uh, with no gas supply required, which makes them ideal for applications uh, for on-site units and we apply them in mobile sample preparation units. And um, what we're able to provide with the approach that I've taken is uh, direct mineral quantification. So it's not, uh, the thing that's different is that it's not spectral reprocessing. It, we're not looking, we're looking at a direct path length, so it's direct mineral quantification, usually with a dynamic range of between uh, 0.1 and 100% uh, for a wide range of minerals. Uh, with an accuracy which is at the very least comparable to XRD and in the case of many minerals uh, exceeds that. So I think we've, um, I guess, dis discussed a little bit already about uh, infrared. Uh, the instrumentation that I utilise, uh, we have uh, a range of between uh, 400 and uh, 4000 uh, which puts it in the uh, mid-infrared range. And also, um, as discussed previously, we're looking at predominantly uh, vibrational uh, bond uh, theory, um, which allows us to identify key peaks associated with minerals. And because we're looking at a fixed path length approach, um, those uh, peak positions, those responses, uh, are directly proportional to mineralogical concentrations. So it's very quick to get the data small amount of powder literally as quick as that so what's different uh, with what I'm doing compared to the handheld instrumentation uh, well I use uh, an attenuated reflectance system uh, whereby um, the Effectively, you have two plates, the upper plate and the lower plate, um, which give you a fixed path length. Now, the advantage of using uh, that sort of approach over the handheld instrumentation is that you don't have to apply any correction factors and that the, um, the response that you get for each mineral um, is a direct response. So you can actually get the mineralogical data there and then in the field. Uh, typically, uh, you can analyse in the order of two to 300 samples per shift shift and that's two to three hundred samples of which we'll get uh, the mineralogical data there and then. Um, if you use that in conjunction with a portable XRF, um, so that's two to three hundred samples which you can get uh, full mineralogical and elemental data. So uh, this is the instrumentation that I'm using, it's the Brooker Alpha. Um, I'm now using it with the, um, the new advanced um, detectors, um, which allows me to get uh, a good spectral response on uh, powdered samples. Uh, the samples that I like to deal with um, should be dry and ground to less than 75 microns. The instrument is small, uh, with an area of um, 30 centimetres by 22. It fits on an A4 piece of paper, and it, can, it is utilised in our mobile sample preparation units in combination with the XRF, so both of them fit on a small bench area. And uh, we have uh, sample preparation uh, capability within these units, so you've got portable units which you can take out to site and get mineralogical and elemental data. Um, it uses standard power supply um, and it's available in a variety of different portable formats. You can put a different feature onto the front of this instrument, what's called a drift module, and then it will perform in a similar way to the handheld units. So, um, with the FTIR, um, 
the calibration. Ideally, we like to um, calibrate against the matrix that you are dealing with, uh, but our standard calibrations will operate um, in a similar way to a soil method will do on the, uh, the PXRF systems, and it, it will give you quite reasonable uh, mineralogical data um, on a wide range of different uh, matrices. However, uh, we do like to divide them up into sort of basic groups, uh, namely uh, pegmatites, so we have particular suites of analysis that we carry out the pegmatites, we have suites of analysis that we carry out for sedimentary rocks, and we have suites of analysis that we carry out for igneous and altered rocks. Um, we have a right, wide range of spectral libraries of which to pull on for our data, and most of our calibrations are carried out with a combination of um, um, XRD and QuenScan analyzed samples, uh, as well as synthetic standards. Uh, so the calibrations that we carry out um, don't suffer from some of the error issues that you can have if you are uncertain of the mineralogy which you're using for your calibrations. Um, we can analyse, uh, also do comparative spectral analysis, uh, so we can compare that against, for example, USGS uh, geological uh, standard libraries, and you can export the data into a format which can be used by um, hyperspectral services. Um, we can establish a reference library uh, for your deposit and then we can do quick ID work so you can start to work out where your metamorphic aureoles are and do a quick yes no for drilling programs as to whether you're in the idealized zone. And uh, we can carry out data verification um, as an oversight uh, feature, which we can uh, carry out usually overnight, uh, with data being available then in the SGS cloud network. So, uh, initial custom calibrations of the FTR units. Uh, we like, if we can, to provide a custom calibration for each individual deposit and base the mineralogical data on a limited number of samples analysed by XRD and QuemScan. This acts as a benchmark uh, for providing um, good mineralogical data. In, additional to, uh, in addition to um, the calibrations that we carry out, we do also do a full calibration um, where we can utilise uh, QAQC cross-checks. So, for example, if you've got a study where you um, are not carrying out your initial calibration, we can do that as we move along, say 5% of samples being sent back to the lab uh, for uh, checks, uh, therefore accounting for any changes in matrices. Uh, the higher high confidence of the data, obviously, the better the, the, the quality for decision making. So, uh, what sort of minerals um, suites do we offer? Uh, well, we can do um, a range of different carbonate minerals, and this is just uh, an overview. Um, we can, for example, give very good uh, data on dolomite, calcite and siderite. Uh, we can provide very good data on the clay minerals uh, without any need for any specialised pre-prep work. Um, we do, for some of the lab-based studies, uh, we provide uh, data using this sort of approach now rather than necessarily a need for a glycol pre-prep. Uh, because it can produce uh, the similar quality of data that you get from a glycol pre-prep, so you can turn two days' worth of analysis into a couple of hours, which gives you much faster turnarounds. Uh, we can analyse uh, for a wide range of felspars. Uh, we can even identify minerals associated uh, with the fluorine deposits. And, um, as I said, mentioned with pegmatites, we can look at spodumene contents, micaceous contents, and identify different types of micaceous phases. Uh, we can also tie mineralogy back to elemental contents. So, for example, if we're looking at bauxites, uh, we can use the elemental co uh, mineralogical contents to tie back to things like total alumina, total silica, total iron, etc. So, um, for quantification, well, this is a typical spectra from the instrumentation, and we take uh, a couple of different approaches to um, carrying out calibration. You can go for a, a univariate calibration approach where you're uh, selecting particular areas of the spectra associated with specific minerals uh, and their responses and um, give a calibration based on those specific regions, or you can carry out a multivariate approach. This is where it takes the whole spectral region and using um, artificial intelligence, it identifies the key spectral regions and responses and gives you uh, mineralogical concentrations based on that. 
Um, there are pros and cons to both techniques. Um, multivariate is a very powerful uh, approach. However, um, when you are selecting the models, it's always a good idea to overview uh, because you have to be careful to make sure that the um, the quantification approach that you are taking is actually relating to the mineral you're wanting to quantify and not simply um, changes in matrices which may or may not be associated with mineralogical concentration. So the typical sort of uh, calibrations that lines that we get, uh, well this is for uh, chlorite which can be a tricky little um, clay mineral. <coughs> And you can see that typically um, our R squared values are greater than 99. So you've got a pretty high degree of confidence uh, that the quantification values that you're given are indeed correct. However, um, you can use it for a wide range of other minerals. And this is a typical uh, calibration line for calcite. So again, your R squareds are in excess of 99. And um, where we're tying uh, mineralogical uh, concentrations back to elemental concentrations, um, we can either take this uh, from mineral concentrations directly, or sometimes we might look at a principal components analysis and use um, artificial intelligence as well uh, to relate um, mineralogical to elemental. And this is a typical bauxite uh, calibration. So these are the typical R squared values that you get for a wide range of minerals. This is by no means a comprehensive list. Uh, for example, we can break feldspars into a wide range of different groups. Uh, same with micaceous minerals, uh, carbonate minerals, ferron dolomites, for example. Um, and um, spodumene, we can not simply identify how much spodumene you've got present, but we can also start to work out what type of spodumene, so where you have elemental substitution. So applications, um, we have obviously the clay minerals, uh, we can do total clay contents, we can do the clay speciation, we can work out clay binding capacities, uh, weathering indices, uh, we can use clay minerals associated with other minerals to determine uh, brittleness indices uh, and also aspects of uh, density <clears throat> and specific gravity. Um, with the lithium work, uh, we can do um, phase mineralogy identification, um, or body characterization, the ionic bonding capacity, and uh, we can use it um, in flotation circuits for looking at um, production control. Um, additionally, um, we are now moving to the phases where we can actually identify things like uh, tantalite concentration. So uh, it's not simply a matter of uh, spodumene alone. Uh, with bauxites, we can look at uh, phase mineralogy. Um, so we can look at the, uh, the typical aspects of um, uh, reactive, non-reactive silica um, and um, the um, reactive, non-reactive alumina, uh, total, total titania and total um, iron oxides, as well as uh, looking at some of the other uh, matrix changes. Um, for uh, some of the FTIR applications, well, for pegmatite analysis, we have a basic method, uh, which is simply um, spodumene concentration, quartz, total feldspar, and total mica. Or we have a uh, more customized calibration, which will give you the spodumene, the quartz, uh, the different feldspar phases, uh, different micaceous phases, um, with other minerals being available um, on request. So this is applicable for both um, the exploration phases and also for the production control. Um, for sedimentary rocks, we have the basic methodology, uh, which we use for um, giving you quartz content, feldspar, calcite, dolomite, and total clay. Um, for the more custom-based calibrations, we can give you a wide range of minerals, including different um, micaceous phases, different feldspars, different clay minerals, um, the quartz, obviously, and a range of other minerals on request. We can also integrate the data. Uh, we can combine um, the elemental data with the um, mineralogical data to provide uh, comprehensive mineralogical logs. And uh, we can shoot this data into the, um, the logging systems or into um, a hyperspectral uh, data file. And we can also um, take the data and use the um, 
um, AI functionality provided by our Geostats team to work out the relationship between uh, key elements and the um, mineralogical contents. Uh, we've done this quite a lot for, for example, nickel laterite deposits. So, uh, FTR applications, uh, direct mineral identification and quantification, uh, calibration for a wide range of mineral uh, and rock types, uh, including uh, proxies for targeting and correlation work between drill holes. Uh, we can do clay speciation without, without the need for the additional uh, glycol prepreps that would be associated with XRD. Uh, we have a robust bench-mounted design uh, which we can deploy in um, our mobile sample preparation units and it's relatively low cost, rapid turnaround, typically, as I say, in excess of 200 samples per day per shift. Um, if you're working 24-hour uh, shifts, obviously that can be in the order of 500 samples per day. And we utilize it as part of our um, FAST program, so that's field analytical uh, services and testing, uh, where we take these things out at MSPUs, um, put them onto um, uh, either mine, site, in mine sites or exploration sites, and provide data within 24 hours uh, or even within a couple of hours to allow you to get um, decision making there and then. Thank you.